about this. You know, um, this uh, talks about um, uh, hydrogen fuel, sure, which has 43,000 BTUs of heat energy per pound of hydrogen. That's what that equation is there. Yeah. The enthalpy available. And you notice it's time, 43,000 times what mixture ratio are operating at divided by 8. Why is that 8 in there? Because that's the mixture ratio that hydrogen and ox or the oxygen and hydrogen combine to make water at. Yeah. So that's the so-called stoichiometric mixture ratio. And if you don't have that stoichiometric mixture ratio, that means you have a fuel-rich mixture ratio. So th that pretty much tells the story right there. If you don't have a mixture, if you're not operating in a mixture ratio of eight, you don't get 43,000 BTUs per pound. You get something less because all of that hydrogen cannot combine with oxygen. Uh, for instance, if you had a mixture ratio of four, um, and four over eight is one half, you see, for your one pound of hydrogen, um, only half of that pound is actually able to combine with oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, that's the problem with, let me go back here. You see, I, I made this little story up here. Come on. Um, which way do I want to go here? Yeah, I made up this little story here about the big bad wolf and the advanced performance rocket and the three little rocket piggies. Whoops, hit the wrong button. Uh oh, okay. No, it's not awkward. Okay, uh, what happened? Uh, I think you probably hit one of these buttons. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, it's Kate. Yes, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Just, just, just go on. Okay, let's go back. This, that's why I'm told this little story here. This uh, book was produced by Rocketdyne in 1958. Uh, it's a good book, but it has a fundamental error in it. Um, and you see, the rocket cognoscenti believe that information that's in there. And so when you talk to those people, they can't hear you because fuel-rich mixture ratios are... Uh, uh, that's why this little short story was supposed to... And, and the same thing in this book here. It's a good book. But it repeats this um, misinformation that's in there. It's, it, in fact, it doesn't even do as good as the first book. The first book shows a point um, where the ISP for a mixture ratio of three and a half is greater than a mixture ratio for eight. Huh. You see, that's incorrect. That's but everybody believes that. Um, I don't know if I can find a, this is in a, a chart. Let me see if I can find this information. Let's go here and see what we got. Yes, here we go. Um, yes, here's this. Yes, okay. If, if you compute the specific impulse, uh, theoretically, you get this upper curve here. Yeah. Need my pointer. Let me get sure. my pointer here. And um, that's the theory. Now you notice all those data points for those real engines are. Uh, uh, down below that, they don't. They don't match. Why don't they match? Why don't these? Why don't these? Data points here. Uh, why aren't they up on here? Well, let's go back. Uh, where's my? So, uh, science 
reason they don't match is, you should notice here, you bleed off hydrogen and oxygen to run these, these turbo pumps here. And that's the energy, that, that energy is lost because it's driving these turbo pump combinations. So if you didn't bleed this off, you'd be up on that curve. I could have corrected for the power it takes to run these turbines, and I didn't do that. So that's why that curve shows that uh, um, that's why that curve, that's that loss there, is the energy that was used by this that split off to run those turbines. So that, that's why these are down from that theoretical line here. But now you see this data here, There's I just connected these two points up because the book just calculates, shows this value at this mixture ratio and shows this value at this mixture ratio and it says, oh, aha, this, this mixture ratio has a greater specific impulse than the uh, stoichiometric mixture ratio, and that's in, this in, that's in error. It's not correct. You see, they didn't know how to calculate specific impulse back in 1958. In 1958, I didn't know how to calculate specific impulse. And they got it wrong. You see, they got the magnitude wrong, and they got the slope wrong. It should go like this instead of like this. So that's the misinformation that's in it. Just kind of seems like a small point, but there's a lot of rocket cognoscenti who talk to you and say, you see what they say is that somewhere between these two points there's an optimum. See, it says the curve goes like this. Uh -huh. You see it falls off and it doesn't. It keeps increasing. This, this, is, this is what you should be operating. You don't waste any fuel here. Here, you're jumping uh, at this point here, operating at this mixture ratio of six, you're dumping 25% of the hydrogen overboard, mm -hmm. not used, you got no energy out of it, it costs you to carry it up there and then you just dump it overboard, it's wasted. So it, it, it's kind of hard to get that across, but a lot of people we talk to believe this theory that fuel rich mixture ratio so the first thing you have to get it of course you have to educate these people that they're mistaken that's really hard to get people to oh I've been wrong all this time I have guys I've presented this at uh, propulsion conferences and a guy comes up to me and says well that's an interesting talk but you know we decided back in 1958 that uh, fuel rich mixture ratios were optimum and there was a guy in here, I gave this talk yesterday, and, and there's a guy in here that, and he says, well, you, you're not accounting for the expansion ratio. And but you notice the expansion ratio has nothing to do with specific impulse. Let's go and look at that. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the other book is interesting. The, the first book gave these two data points, and I just connected them up to kind of show where it lies. But the other book doesn't even do that much. He starts out with the general energy equation, and then he makes some substitution uh, for um, uh, pressure and density, and says, oh, see, the density here is less, so fuel-rich mixture ratios, and he expands on this fuel-rich mixture, and that's what it says. So both these books have this misinformation in them, and a lot of people you talk to will tell you, oh, that book says that fuel-rich mixture ratios are... So we can't build an advanced performance rocket engine because we can't get the, the cognoscenti again uh, to believe that they're... That stoichiometric mixture ratios are the optimum, which they clearly are. Uh, so, so, I mean, has, has anybody done you know, experiments or, or something to try to, to show one way or the other? I'm the only, yeah, it, yes, I have. I'm the only one apparently out there who is promoting this, and I've, 
Uh, I keep writing my letters to my congressman and to NASA and to the newspapers, Space News and Aviation Week, and telling them that they don't pay much attention to Dale out here. Um, so we need to re-educate people. I'm trying to re-educate you guys right now. I don't know how I'm succeeding or not. Let's, um, let's, let me go to another chart here. Well, yeah, let's talk about this a minute. Here's a, a specific impulse, and here's RS-68 yeah. uh, and the J-2 and the space shuttle on, and on, into the on operated foreign advanced performance rocket engine. Um, now the problem is, you see, if you operate closer to that mixture ratio, there's the problem. Your temperature in your combustion chamber goes up, and they can't build a combustion chamber that will operate at this temperature. The space shuttle is doing pretty good. You've got a couple of hundred degrees of temperature, so you need to really, the research NASA should be doing is developing high temperature combustion chambers uh, that would take that heat. Because that's, that's, that's difficult to do, isn't it? Uh, okay, well, let's, uh, let's, um, now I save on the ground, it gives you half a pound more payload in orbit. Now the current uh, space shuttle, uh, first thing that's wrong with it, we, we built common bulkhead tanks back in the Saturn Apollo days, so why now are we building these double bulkhead tanks with this wasted space in here? Um, this vehicle carries 58,000 pounds of excess hydrogen operating. If you divide that to two, that's 29,000, or around that to 30,000 pounds. That's 15 more tons. Instantly, you get 15 more tons in a payload into orbit with an advanced performance engine operating. But the other payoff is, is you see the external tank, because you're using less fuel, it's not as big. So, this diameter goes from 27 feet to 23 feet with a common bulkhead tank, which is we did on the Saturn Apollo, so why are we doing this later on? I could never understand that. But 23, that's 25% less aerodynamic drag, so there's losses that you don't have to go through. And, um, um, let's see, there was another point I was going to make about this, but... Uh, um, it escapes me right now. Um, let me, uh, so anyway, you get a smaller tank. Uh, well, yes, because this tank is smaller, it's um, about. Um, I got a chart here with the numbers. Also, Let's talk about this for a minute. This is uh, 
this is a vehicle, you may not have heard this, I got this out of Aviation Week, there's a vehicle called the United Launch Alliance, and the idea, and there's a model of it out there uh, right now, uh, using space shuttle propulsion components, but a cargo carrying vehicle. And that was this vehicle here in Aviation Week. And they said they could put 77 tons into orbit. If you use advanced performance rocket engines, you can put 90 tons into orbit. Now, I've taken a lot of liberties with this thing. Um, the first place you can notice here, they had a very blunt nose on it. And that's very high drag. So I took the liberty of putting an ogival nose on here like the tank, which is lower drag. They also had no vertical fin on this. So it was laterally aerodynamically unstable. We learned a lot when we learned to shoot bow and arrow, you had to put feathers on to make it stable. We should do that now. So uh, I put that on there. Now notice I've added, there's a truss right here, and I've fared that in to make a fin here, and put some fins down here. This external tank is aerodynamically unstable. And why is the foam coming off? Well, you see this uh, bipod right here, because this is aerodynamically stable, it's being controlled by these engines and the solid propellant booster, so it's, it's vibrating like that, because it's unstable. It wants to take off, and it's being controlled. So, that right there causes, you can't see it in flight, this high frequency, but it's causing deformation of that tank at that point. It's doing this. And that's what's cracking the foam off of the shuttle, and that's what did the Challenger in it. Um, um, so we really should put, I'm an aerodynamicist, you really put, should put fins on the tank, make it aerodynamically stable. So I've done that, and I've shown the 23 foot diameter. Um, but anyway, so you're right there, you get the, uh, uh, what, uh, 23 more, no, 13 more tons into orbit uh, with that vehicle, and that's a lot of payload into orbit. Um, but back to what we were discussing, I'm trying to find this. Um, yeah, here's our chart. Oh, okay, here's our cost. See? Here's, here's, uh, here's the cost that, uh, you know, this RS-68 engine uh, operates really inefficiently. It only has a, uh, a 315 seconds impulse. Um, it dumps a whole, it's, it was built for the Air Force to be a throwaway engine because it couldn't afford the the space shuttle main engines being proprietary and all of their intricate, complicated, uh, integrated turbo pumps, the proprietary, cost a lot of money. So they're too expensive to throw away. Uh, so they developed this for the Air Force to be a throwaway for expendable launch vehicles. And, um, and it really should not be used for a vehicle that's going to put a heavy lift vehicle that's going to return you to Mars or return you to the moon and take you to Mars. Um, and that's why I think the decision, the president made the right decision to cancel the constellation, that's the Ares 1 and Ares 5, because that's too inefficient an engine. It would cost, uh, they're talking about the cost of the space shuttle. Uh, it would cost uh, uh, well, the, the space shuttle cost about 450 million dollars a launch, um, 22 million, uh, 29 million dollars of that is fuel cost. 29 million dollars for the hydrogen and fluid of that um, a vehicle into orbit, $37 million more just for the fuel because it's so inefficient. Fuel that is not used, it's just dumped overboard. Um, 
and the relative tank cost. So the, the, the advanced performance product is obviously a better thing to do. It costs you seven million dollars less in fuel, uh, thirteen percent less weight, which costs you less, and twenty-five percent less aerodynamic drag. Uh, all of these things save you money and put more payload, so you get more payload, a greater payload in order at lesser cost, and that'll maintain the United States leadership in space. We see what we should be doing. We really should be building an advanced performance rocket engine rather than build it. The Congress is telling NASA to build a heavy lift vehicle when we don't have a engines ready to do that. NASA should be telling Congress, no, we shouldn't build this heavy lift vehicle. We should build an advanced performance rocket engine. That's, that's, that's my thesis. What do you guys think of that? Tell me. Any questions? Or, uh, I have some questions, maybe. Yeah. Um, you, you, you said that some of the engines have expansion nozzles that are, that are much bigger than they need to be. I'm curious, yes. like how how do you yes. how do you calculate that? Thank how you. do you? Because I, I mean, I've 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 read a bit of of, of the Sutton book, yes. so I mean, I, I know a little bit. But why is it too big? Let me go to this chart here. Find it. Uh, there's no, there we are. Yes. Oh man. You know. That general energy equation back earlier. Mm -hmm. You've got the heat energy that's that you get from burning the fuel. That's potential energy. Yeah. And you equate that to kinetic energy, and that tells you how much exhaust velocity you have. Now you see, if you've got this much potential energy, that's all you can get. You can't get any more. So it doesn't matter how much you expand it, you aren't getting getting any more, and that's the problem. See, in fact, this is the shuttle main engine. You see it's up here at, at an expansion ratio of 70, and that's most of two-thirds of that is unusable. You see this chart right, this button right there? That's at that point, at that expansion ratio, about 25. If you expand that, yeah, uh, combustion chamber gases with the potential energy that they have to into kinetic energy, that's all at, all. at that point you've got you you've got all that potential energy converted into ki kinetic energy. So it doesn't matter how much expansion you've got after that, you don't get any more energy out of it. And there's a school of, again there's a school of thought, the rocket cognoscenti um, I had a conversation with a guy at Marshall Space Flight Center, and he had two unintroduced people listening into the conversation. And, and, then, and they said, I heard them say in the conversation, well, he doesn't know about getting specific impulse by exp more expansion. You see, that's, that's, I'm sorry, that's ignorance of uh, um, lack of knowledge. You cannot get any more kinetic energy than the potential energy that's available. So that, you see, that's exactly what I'm saying. The SSME has, at, at expansion ratio of 25, you've gotten all the energy out of that potential energy that you can't. So everything from here over to here is wasted. Why are we spending all this money building this, this rocket with this huge expansion that's unusable. You can't get it. You can't expand it anymore. Um, you can't get any more energy out of it. This is, this is, this is it, at about 25 uh, is what the uh, space shuttle, and this is what it has. That that's the, illustrates the difference. You see, here's the, the advanced performance rocket engine here. Uh, I've got a chart out there, it says 30, but it's really probably closer to 27 or something. Here's the RS-68 back here. Um, and the J this, this here is the J-2 engine. And I, I can show you the, 
Let's talk about that. Let me find that. Where's that J2 engine? All right. Um, it's this way. It's the other way. So, science fiction products are used to be side by channel, side by science. That's a computer copy of the network. Ha! Yes! This is the J2 engine that we put on the Saturn S2 vehicle, and notice the expansion ratio that it has is quite small. We spent a billion and a half dollars redeveloping this engine. They're doing it now. Yeah. A billion and a half dollars for seven years. They're testing it at the uh, Marshalls, uh, at the Mississippi Test Facility right now, the seven year development. This engine, and what did they do? They put this, you see this big nozzle they added on here? Why? You don't get anything out of that. That's all a waste of money and effort and time and weight. Um, now, they did make an improvement here. This engine operated at a uh, combustion chamber pressure of 800 PSI. This operates at 1,200 psi. That was that's a positive change that they made. Um, but uh, you see this school of thought that you get more impulse by putting a big nozzle on, and you don't. We got as much out of this as we did with this, except we only had 800 psi chamber pressure here, and they got 1,200 psi. So the gain in that, I'll have to grant. Now, there's some other things here to talk about. Notice this has uh, this has two turbines. It has one for the oxidizer and another one for the fuel. And just two turbine pumps. And you notice the inlets here, this little bracket right here. And why? That's because this engine is swiveled to get it attitude control, to change the direction. And so when you swivel this this way, this duct has to extend, and this one has to compress. And um, and then they have back here, they have a gimbal bearing, a heavy gimbal bearing that lets it swivel. And here you see this attach point. There's two heavy hydraulic actuators that have to move that engine. and. Uh, now, now some engines, let's go and look at another one here. This is, a, yeah, this is a schematic of that J2 engine, and you can't tell by just some picture, but this is how it works. Um, you bring the oxidizer in, and you bleed some of that off into this gas generator, and same with the fuel, bleed some of that off, and use this to generate the, uh, the steam and uh, hydrogen that comes through there. It turns these turbines, and then you dump back into the combustion chamber. Okay, let's look at the next one here. Here's a space shuttle man engine. Let's go through this again. We have, as we indicated here, we have two thirds, at least, too much nozzle here. You can replace this nozzle. This is a cheap way to build an advanced performance rocket engine. Replace this nozzle with a composite nozzle, which will be a lot simpler. This is a whole bunch of little tubes. They're all brazed together, and then these half bands around there to give it strength. And when it starts up, it goes, uh, you think it's going to come apart. Um, now, the, notice this doesn't have two turbines. This has four. You notice, here's the first turbine pump over here, and then you notice, see this wrap around, ducting goes around, and then you're down to this second turbo pump combination here. And the same thing for the other one, this comes from, and there's another turbo pump behind this, on the square, you can't see it, and then it comes around and goes down into this turbo pump in this area, vicinity here. So there's four turbo pumps, right? that's expensive. Now, why do we have wrap-around ducting? Notice the other one was the, it went like that. Mm -hmm. Well, because this gimbals too, and you see it's a lot easier to build, bend that 
conducting this way than yeah. it is to make it do this. Yeah. So, but that's expensive, complex wraparound ducting. If you didn't gimbal this engine, you could make it less expensive. You could get rid of, see this right here is this hydraulic actuator, a big 900 pound actuator, there's two of them on there. Hydraulic actuators to gimbal this engine. And um, so let's, now let's, you can, yeah, you can't tell much about it, but let's look at the next diagram. here. Okay. Here's a schematic diagram of that space shuttle main engine. You see we have a turbo pump combination over here on the, um, that's fuel side, and another integrated turbo pump combination over here on the fuel side. And uh, so the first four turbo pumps, and then you notice instead of bringing that hot gas down and dumping it in here in a low pressure area, it goes right into the combustion chamber like the rest of the fuel up here. Um, so um, we could. Um, if you want to look at my out there, there's a there's a couple of pictures out of one of those combustion chamber here, and the other is the extension nozzle right there. And you can make an inexpensive advanced performance rocket engine by putting a high temperature combustion chamber in here and putting a composite nozzle on here, and that would convert the space shuttle main engine to an advanced performance rocket engine. Mm. It would still be expensive because it has all this expensive uh, turbo pump uh, stuff here, um, but uh, it would be pretty cheap to build new components here and put them again. Uh, that, that, that's a cheapy way, but the other way is to build an uh, advanced performance rocket engine directly. Right here. Now, why is this less expensive? It's less expensive because we don't have integrated turbines and pumps. You get a contractor to build you a turbine, and that's it. You get a contractor to sell you pumps, and that's it. You buy a gearbox, and then you put them together. You just bolt it together. I think that makes it less expensive. I think Plus, you notice you only have two turbines instead of four. That cuts the cost way down right there. I, th I think we're almost out of time. Pardon? I think we're almost out of time. Yeah, we are. Let's, let me let me look at one more chart here. Oh. Uh, I think yes. Okay. If we got rid of those. Uh, gimbling the engine, you get rid of that duct, the expensive duct, you know, the expensive actuators, those heavy gimbal bearings, all that gets a lot simpler, and you can put rocket exhaust diversion vanes out here with smaller electromechanical actuators and divert your rocket exhaust boom that way. Thanks for listening, guys. Hey, well, thank you. <laughs> I hope I educated you a little bit. Thanks hey, very I'd much. Like to, yeah. I'd like to hear new okay. like right. okay. information. I appreciate it. Who's next? Come on in. All right.